And I would ask you, friends, to cur Mila Mila Foilcha Riv James Connolly Heron. I think um, a message goes out from this great gathering this evening to every other political party in the country. Be afraid. Be very afraid. Uktaran Sinn Féin, Deputy Leader, Mary Lou MacDonald, Lord Mayor, friends, Comrades, happy centenary year. We stand here today, I stand here today in this most historic of locations. I'm very grateful and appreciate deeply the invitation to address such a gathering on this momentous year. Once again, Sinn Féin steal a march on other political parties, the first political party to organize a commemorative event in this new calendar year. I commend Sinn Féin for the support they've given to the campaign to save the last extant 1916 battlefield, our houses of history. Only today, the developers moved in and started demolition works. Late on this afternoon, we heard that a group of campaigners have now occupied some of the houses along the terrace. As most of you are aware, we've been in long-term consultation, negotiation with various government ministers. And our call has always been for state intervention because it is the state's responsibility since 2007 to preserve what's left of Moore Street. And they should preserve what's left of Moore Street because it was the last stand of the brave men and women to whom, to whom we owe so much. Five of the signatories to our proclamation of independence, so well read to us this evening, spent their last hours of freedom in Moore Street. Not in one house, not in four houses, in the entire terrace from number 10 to number 25. And let the message go out from this great gathering this evening. Moore Street, the last extant 1916 battlefield site in this great city of ours, will not be demolished on our watch. There is an opportunity to build a lasting cultural historic quarter in honour of a generation of our people to whom we owe so much. That opportunity will not come again. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. How fortunate we are to be here this evening at the beginning of a centenary year. Not every generation has that privilege. And I know there's probably nobody in the audience this evening who's not thinking of somebody who would willingly love to be here but who can't be here. So we acknowledge all our departed friends who otherwise would be here in this great gathering with us this evening through a round of applause. Nineteen sixteen, our centenary and our celebration. The late Sean Cronin wrote of them none considered himself a hero, but all were heroes. There were fewer than nine hundred of them, and they challenged an empire. They were ordinary men and women, and their military training was minimal. In that lies their glory. They believed that Ireland should be free. In that lies their greatness. One lifetime ago, a golden generation of our people volunteered to free our country from 800 years of colonial rule, oppression and conquest. How fortunate we are to be part of a centennial celebration of that event and to remember and pay tribute to those men and women who together fought in the cause of Irish freedom, theirs and ours. 
This was a generation not prepared to go to hell or to Connacht, not prepared to live in servitude and slavery, not prepared to live as second-class citizens, not prepared to starve to death in disease-ridden tenement hovels, and most remarkable of all among their number, a generation of women no longer willing to be slaves of the slave, but destined to become the ar arguably the first armed and uniformed women's movement in world history. We salute them all. Writers, poets, playwrights, sportsmen, artists, actors, journalists, trade union members and ordinary working men and women went out to break the connection with an empire upon which they were told the sun never set and they changed the course of Irish history forever. They did so for no monetary gain, for no monetary reward. And that is what sets them apart. Theirs was a selfless sacrifice. And today we are all of us the direct beneficiaries of their sacrifice. Writing of British imperialism in the Guardian newspaper, journalist John Mombriat puts it well. The story of benign imperialism whose overriding purpose was not to seize land, labour and commodities, but to teach the natives good table manners and double entry bookkeeping is a myth that has been carefully propagated by the right wing press but it draws its power from a remarkable national ability to airbrush and disregard our past. Does this sound familiar? In November 2015, 14, sorry, on an infamous evening in our recent history, a night never to be forgotten, our government set out an Ireland Inspires programme that purported to remember that golden generation in the spiritual home of the rising, the GPO. There, on a video screen in front of various state and invited dignitaries from around the globe, the men and women of 1916 were written out of history in the very place where they made history, as if they never lived, as if they never died. Not a single image of a 1916 leader or volunteer, man or woman, appeared on that big screen. The heroes of our history, the fathers of the nation, were replaced by images of, among others, the Queen of England, David Cameron, Dr. Ian Paisley, Brian O'Driscoll, and Bono. <laughs> what centenary, what commemoration, and what celebration was being planned, many asked, as well they might. Who were the mysterious architects of this charade? We simply do not know. The taming of nationalism moment had arrived. This was a blatant and shameful airbrushing exercise in a distortion of our history, in an attempt to distance citizens from that history and diminish and detract from a golden generation of that time, of any time, the likes of which we have not seen since. But that GPO airbrushing exercise failed because ordinary men and women, citizens, supported by 1916 relatives, rejected out of hand this disgraceful revisionist attempt to distance citizens from a connection to our past, to our history, to our people, and their fight for freedom, their freedom, and our freedom. As a direct result of public outcry and the launch of a proposed relative centenary programme, and the Sinn Féin commemorative programme, there is now, at last, an official state programme of commemoration. But what did they have to fear? What was there to hide? Who is to benefit from the portrayal of that seminal moment in our history as just another event in a decade of historic events? We are to remember all who died in a shared history, we are told. Inclusivity, the new buzzword emanating from those charged with the protection of our history and heritage, multiple wreath-laying ceremonies for all combatants, royal family participation in commemorative events, remembering all who died, rather than honouring those who died in the cause of our freedom. Endless attempts at detracting from the importance of the rising as a standalone event worthy of commemoration in its own right. In honouring everybody in general, we commemorate nobody in particular. For over 20 years, a generation of our people were told nothing of that extraordinary moment in our history, told nothing of the notion of sacrifice for a high ideal, told nothing of that golden generation, of their aims and their ideals in the creation of a free Ireland from the centre to the sea, 
The rising was not so much revised as hidden away. 1916 relatives lived with this insult year in, year out, under successive administrations who occupied their positions of authority as a direct result of the sacrifice of those they choose to forget. The result of this failure to allow a generation access to that knowledge left us a culture of greed and avarice and corruption that did untold damage to politics and society, the effects of which we are still saddled with today. An opportunity in our time to build a society of equality in housing, in education, in health, the great pillars of a civilized, civilized society was squandered and lost on an altar of greed and corruption that haunts us to this day. We need only check the hospital corridors, the hostels and homeless shelters for the evidence. James Connolly held that the freedom of a nation is measured by the freedom of its lowest class. And it was and is that class that paid and continues to pay for the misdeeds of others. A program of austerity was levelled against an entirely innocent section of society. A society where banks are bailed out of financial difficulty by public funding, while citizens are evicted from their homes by those same banks. Where failed and bankrupt developers are deemed experts in business, deserving of NAMA salaries paid out of the public purse. A society where over 1,000 children are homeless, where our elderly are left lying on hospital trolleys awaiting medical treatment, where a large section of our young population are forced through financial circumstance to leave the country of their birth, leaving heartbroken and broken families behind in parishes that are fast becoming ghost towns, our best and our brightest lost to us. And all through this time they read of the obscene salary payments, pension plans, lavish lifestyles that a privileged section of our society continue to enjoy, the very section of society willing to sacrifice their country for their lifestyles. Some shamefully still fumbling in that greasy till. One loads of money elected representative is not a minor problem. From where and what circumstance do such people emerge, serving their own interest rather than the interest of those that elect them to public office? Some apparently unable to answer a simple question, do you own property, without advice and assistance? <laughs> and those young people who refuse to leave the country of their birth, the leaders of tomorrow, upon whose shoulders the future of our country rests, shake their heads and wonder why. How did it come to this, they ask? How indeed? Perhaps it came to this because along the way, while according to some we all parted, that connection to a proud past was lost. It came to this because a generation of our time had no heroes, for they were never told of them. It came to this because they were never told that freedom did not fall from the sky. They believed that it was always so. So they knew nothing of Clark, McDermott, McDonough, Plunkett or Pierce, Kant, Connolly, Markovics, Lynn, Gifford, Skinner, Comerford, or Maloney knew nothing of their contribution to the cultural rebirth of a defeated nation and the rich legacy they left us that deserves to be embraced and cherished with pride. Pride in our language, not a dismissal of it. Pride in our flag, not a disregard for it. Pride in our anthem, not a replacement of it. Pride in our pursuit of freedom and not an apology for it. Their, their vision of freedom remains the yardstick by which we measure the march of our nation and the foundation of a real republic that serves the needs of all citizens. This country does not belong to any particular group, neither a banking elite, a developer speculator elite or a political elite. Its title deeds are ours to be held in trust for future generations. 
And since the centenary is our centenary, its celebration and commemoration must be ours. It must be our commemoration. A citizen celebration of what happened, not what might have happened, would have happened, or could have happened. A celebration without the apology of a proud past guiding us into a better future. A citizen's salute. Not merely a centenary celebration of that golden generation in their time, but also an examination of our country in our time. Where stands the republic for which they fought? Where stands the republic for which they died? What happened to the dream that they dared dream? And what of our dream? What will future generations make of us if we dare not fundamentally change the failed politics of the past for the promise of a better future? Some see things and ask why. Together, we can change the course of Irish politics by asking, why not? That time is now. We have not lost the notion of society, of sharing, of caring, of lending a hand, of sacrifice. It's still within us. Examples abound in our everyday lives. It's in our collective DNA. It can be rediscovered in a new Ireland, in a real republic. We need to rediscover it. There is no better time than now. Politics can and must be returned to the people. This is our time. This can be our golden moment. We can set about building a society of equality based on the principles of the 1916 proclamation that's not only to be read, but is to be implemented. That is the path that is set out before us on the eve of this centenary celebration. Facing that challenge together can be the basis of that celebration. An election approaches, I'm sure you've noticed. The opportunity again to create a coalition of progressive forces that can in our time pledge to change, of course, to change the course of Irish history. It is clear that the people of Ireland now want an alternative to the failed and tired politics of the past. The politics of spin, of bluff and bluster, the politics of favours asked, favours granted, promises made but soon forgotten, pledges made but soon broken. The politics of the club rather than the politics of the people. An alternative can be presented if there is a will to do so. It's clear that there is so much more that unites us than divides us. A coalition of the left makes more sense than a coalition with the right. We must return politics to the secure embrace of the people with elected representatives as servants of the people acting in the public interest. Together we can build a society based on the principles of the proclamation, a society of equals with nobody left behind, abandoned, uneducated, uncared for or forced through economic circumstance to leave the country of their birth. If all citizens have a stake in society, then all citizens will sacrifice to build it with vision, but rebuild it as so much more than merely a great little country to do business in. We want it to be a great country to live and prosper in. This is our centenary, a celebration of our past with a plan for the future, cherishing all of the children of the nation with equal rights and equal opportunities for all, mindful of a proud past but with an eye on a better future for all. That is the path and the task now set out before us, a republic of equals, a republic that will serve as a beacon light to the deprived, the marginalised and the forgotten everywhere. It's not only the strength of that march that's important, rather the direction in which we are marching. We can set out on the path mindful of the rich legacy that the men and women of 1916 left us. Dora Sigerson said of them, they lit a fire within their land that long was ashes cold. With splendid dreams they made it glow, threw in their hearts of gold. They lit a beacon in their land, built of the souls of men, to make thee warm once more, Kathleen, to bid thee live again. And so at this time, in this great capital city of rebellion and revolution, at the outset of our celebrations, it can be said that on Clive Sullish, the sword of light is now passing to a new generation of citizens, the incorruptible inheritors of Irish freedom. May it glow ever brighter in their warm embrace, in lasting tribute to the men and women of 1916, under the starry plough, into a bright and better future. Gurumila Mahagiv.